All across America and around the world, this is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. And welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry, Chief Warrant Officer, Helicopter Pilot in Vietnam in 1969. I want to welcome you to our program. And as our introduction just said, we are coming to you from uh, WAAM in Ann Arbor, Michigan, broadcasting around the world, around the world. This is awesome. Uh, you can listen to us as a, on our website. You can listen to us in Detroit on WDTK, out in California, KMET, and in Minnesota and KFOW. So we want to welcome you, as I mentioned, to our program. Today is our benefit show. So write down this phone number, 734-822-1600, 734-822-1600. We're here to answer any questions that you have regarding uh, your VA disability benefits. We'll try to attempt to answer any questions about the health care program from the VA. And we've got a couple of other articles that we want to really uh, talk about today on our program. Um, before we get into that, I want to make sure that you're aware that Veterans Radio is a production of Veterans Radio America. Uh, Veterans Radio America is a nonprofit organization, and so we need your support. So we're asking for your support today. If you could go to our website, that's veteransradio.net, and click on uh, Donate, that would be great. Um, costs money to put this program on. And uh, we've been doing it now going on 18 years in November. And uh, we're hoping that you can help us out to continue doing this. We also want to make sure that we thank our corporate sponsors. And our corporate sponsors are start off with uh, Legal Help for Veterans. Of course, that's uh, they specialize in veteran disability claims. For more information, you can give them a call at 800-693-4800. The National Veterans Business Development Council, better known as NVBDC, is the nation's leading third-party authority for the certification of veterans-owned businesses. This is really important if you want to do business with the government and many corporations if you are a veteran-owned business. So for more information from them, go to their website. That's nvbdc.org. The Eisenhower Center here in Michigan and Florida specializes in treatment for veterans, first responders, athletes, anyone suffering from post-traumatic stress, uh, TBIs or close head injuries. They do, they offer inpatient and outpatient care. And that is the Eisenhower Center. For more information, go to EisenhowerCenter.com. U.S. Wings, a manufacturer and distributor of the finest leather flight jackets in the world. They also manufacture and sell all kinds of military paraphernalia. Go to USWings.com for more information. Stay tuned to find out if we do have a winner this month for the flight jacket. The Charles S. Kettles of VA Medical Center here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, of course, our local veteran service organizations, the Vietnam Veterans of America, better known as the Charles S. Kettles, uh, Chapter 310, uh, the American Legion, Post 46, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Post 423, all here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We can't do it without their support and, again, without your support. So I wanted to get to some news right away. <laughs> This is a story that we have been covering since, I wrote it down here, November of 2007. Many of you may not be aware of it, but there is a Medal of Honor recipient. His name is Father Emil Capon from the Korean War. And Father Capon, um, we've done many stories about him. He was a POW, and he, unfortunately he died while he was a POW in Korea. Um, but he was finally put in for his Medal of Honor, received that Medal of Honor in April, wait a second, in 2013. If you go to our website and just type in the name Kapon, K-A-P-A-U-N, we've got four or five programs that we've done about Father Kapon. Anyhow, they found his remains. This is exciting. Uh, so they found his remains and they are returning him to his home outside of Wichita, Kansas, uh, this weekend, actually. So after 70 years, they found it. And the, the real story about uh, Father Capon is that he is credited with saving hundreds of soldiers during the Korean War. Um, even though he was captured, he continued to share his, his meager rations, anything that he could do, and spiritually to help any of the former prisoners. And finally, he disappeared, as they say. Uh, the remains of it, this is interesting, though. 
So the remains of Father Emil Joseph Capon uh, will be returning on yesterday to the uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower National Airport there in Wichita, Kansas. And his services are going to be held. Here we go. I had it underlined. Where did I put it? Uh, Wednesday. It's coming Wednesday. So what's that going to be? The 26th, 27th, 29th. Uh, the 29th in Wichita. And he is going to, there is a mass of Christian burial, a Hartman a Marina, but which is on the campus of the University of Wichita or Wichita University, I guess is what it's called. Uh, then there's going to be a horse-drawn carriage, the Veterans Memorial Park, to the Cathedral of Immaculate Conception, where he will be laid to rest. Taps and a 21-gun salute will follow. That does that occurs uh, from 1.30 to 2, 2 p.m. on Wednesday, and that would be central time. For those of you out in the middle of Kansas, uh, check out the news. This came from the Hutchinson, um, the Hutchinson News in Kansas, and I, I just think this is a this is a finally a great welcome home for Father Emil Capon. And as I said, you can learn the whole story by just going to our website, veteransradio.net, typing in his name, K-A-P-A-U-N, and all the times that his story has been on Veterans Radio will pop up. So that's that, to me, is really cool news. I want to make sure that I introduce our guest experts today before we get too far into the program. And number one is... Uh, Retired Air Force General Carol Ann Fesson from Legal Help for Veterans. Good afternoon, General. Good afternoon, Dale and Michael, and uh, great to be back with you for another month of benefits. That's right. And also is Michael Smith, uh, Army veteran and executive director of the Washtenaw County Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome back, Michael. It's good to be back on the air with you, Dale. Good to see you, General Fesson. Hey, Derek. (laughs) He's nods. All right. We are here for you, as I mentioned, to answer your questions about anything having to do with the VA, especially, and the, and the VA disability side. As Michael is always quick to point out, there are two separate programs here. We've got the Veterans Health Care Program, and we've got the Veterans Benefits side of the, of the coin. So we don't have our expert for the Veterans Health side, but we do have a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Number one is the copay program, I guess you could say, or the forgetting about the co-pays, that is done October 1st. And so don't be surprised, all you veterans out there that get your care at the uh, at the VA, that you may start getting some co-payment bills starting again. Anything before October 1st, all the way back to, I think it's April 6th of last year. 20, yeah, that's, that's just last year, right? Uh, 2020, um, where they, they just did away with all the co-pays. And if you had any co-pays during that time period that you paid, that was all refunded to you. Well, that ends October 1st. So just be prepared about that. The other thing about the VA healthcare side right now is that the uh, COVID-19 booster shots are available. Uh, it is advised that you contact your primary care uh, doctor to schedule an appointment to get that shot. Um, this is only my personal opinion, but at, at my age <laughs> and some of my friends' age, this would be advisable to some of you. You may want to get that shot because um, I'm finding too many examples of people who have already had the vaccines are getting mild cases of it, and it's not that it's going to necessarily kill you, but there are some serious side effects that are going on with this weird disease. So I think... Um, in my opinion, that I would, I suggest that all of you take advantage of the situation if you can. Get the shot. Hey, you know, think of all the shots we've gotten in our lifetime that we were told to get, you know, and they were active ingredients in those shots. This, you know, COVID-19 vaccine doesn't have any uh, of the actual disease inside of it. So anyway, check with your VA. Or even if, you know, if you're out there with your primary care physician, see if you should be one of the ones that would get the booster shot. Um, I'm just encouraging you to do so if you can. Uh, let's see. The co-pays return. Uh, let's get right into the, to the benefits thing here. Um, so General Fasson, Michael, I had a question for you. And that, you know, we were talking about the, the mail. Before we went on the air, we were talking about the delay in the mail. And there was an article in, I think it was Stars and Stripes, 
that said that there's a 250,000 claim backlog right now. And some of the mail is taking weeks. I just got actually, I just got a letter from July 6th. Um, and there's a terrible story going on about mail being kind of storehouse down at the Atlanta VA that is, uh, you know, it was in a storeroom instead of being, dis- you know, mailed out or dis, you know, distributed. So what, what are we supposed to do if we don't get letters within a particular time period, I guess, because, you know, they always say, um, you know, you have X amount of days to file an appeal. What what are your suggestions? I'll go with General Falzon first. Well, we've been, um, I think we mentioned that um, last month to be, uh, to be aware of the mail, we we're calling it the mail irregularities. And the VA has sent out letters. Um, I'm sure Michael's got one at the county too. Um, we've gotten letters to say, you know, let us know. So we, for our veterans, as they're contacting us, our clients, we are sending an immediate um, letter back that we received it, say, on July 6th. And, uh, you know, the letter was sent July 6th, but we recorded it on September 23rd. And so we were asking for that period of time back um, to respond, especially if it was a 30-day letter, uh, a 30-day notice. And so that's what we're doing for our um, our clients. But sometimes, and we tell our clients this, um, you know, it says the VA is going to notify us as it notifies um, our veterans. And that sometimes doesn't happen. So please communicate with who's ever helping you develop your claim so that you're both in sync together. Okay. Michael, are you experienced some of this? Um, so not really. And, and, and so there's a difference in, 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 in the way that some of us do work and do business. So my staff and I, we have access to the Veterans Benefits Management System, and we're constantly uh, monitoring that for every step in the claims process to include any notification letters. Most times we know before veterans know that there's a letter and we can actually print that letter um, to mitigate any issues that we have with mail. Now, for those veterans who do have problems with mail and they don't have an advocate that has access to VA systems, lots of those letters are also stored in the e-benefits program if they have access to e-benefits and they've created an account. And if they check periodically, uh, they can see uh, letters in there. But as General Fasson already um, mentioned, for those who don't have any of those types of access, the best thing to do is, to, yes, to make copy of the postmark on the envelope for when it left the station to be delivered to the veteran. And you'll see from that postmark the, the, the differences between the date of the letter and the date on the envelope where it was stamped at the last post office station before delivery. And then, like General Fasson said, we can show with copies that said, hey, listen, you, you said I needed to respond uh, with it by this date, but I didn't get your letter until 30 days later or, or, or later or however long. Now, that's just, um, you know, that's just recently. We don't typically have a lot of problems with that. I will say there is one specific issue with mail. It deals with the travel board hearings from the Board of Veterans Appeals for travel board hearings in the state of Michigan. What, what are travel board hearings? Travel board hearings are um, um, a means by which appellants or people who have appeals can have a hearing before an administrative law judge. There's three different ways you can do it. You can go all the way to Washington, D.C. and be face-to-face with an administrative law judge at the VA central office, or you can have a hearing by teleconferencing where the BVA law judge is in Washington, D.C., and you're at a regional office of a VA uh, facility, the other one is the travel board. That's where the administrative law judges actually travel to your state. And this, in this case, they would 
come to the Detroit regional office and they would be there and available for people to have hearings. Well, those notification letters did not go out on time. And the reason why is that the printing vendor that had contracted with the VA, uh, BVA, um, was understaffed and they could not get the letters out. The VA is aware of that. They're very embarrassed about that. And so in these types of instances, the VA acknowledges that they're at fault in the notification process. And so they're giving veterans a 60 day extension of the date or the time frame within which they were supposed to respond because they know they didn't get the letters in time. Um, and that's just a very recent development. And that uh, came directly from the uh, director of the Detroit regional office just last week, Thursday, when she was joining our Michigan Association of County Veteran Counselors at our fall conference in Muskegon. So that was just, that's recent news from her directly from the director. Okay. Um, Michael, you just mentioned that, that you had a, a, a conference with all of, all of the county um, veteran service departments. Yes, we had a, about 105 of our 142 uh, county veteran service officers from the various uh, county departments of veterans affairs all around the state. We were in Muskegon for our fall conference. Yes. What did you learn? Well, those fall conferences are 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 just an eight hour block. Our conferences that have continuing education units, those are in the spring. Those That's about a four day conference. So um, on um, last Thursday, we had um, the person out of the Battle Creek Medical Center did a presentation on uh, self-care and suicide prevention. We had a presentation, a panel presentation from the Michigan Veterans Affairs Agency that included the, the director, Zanetta Adams, the deputy director, Robert Neer, their outreach person, Robert Engel, and their new uh, grants person. Um, we had a, a presentation from Social Security Administration, another presentation from John Drumsta out of the regional office on disability compensation, this non-service connected disability pension, and the burial allowances that are available through the VA. And um, I could go pull my agenda, but off, off the top of my head, that's Pretty that's much what pretty I can good. That, that's pretty good. I want to remind everybody we've got the experts here for you right now. 734-822-1600. That's 734-822-1600. Um, I was curious only because of, you know, I guess one of the good news items that I, that I found for today's program is it looks like people that are on disability claims are going to be getting a pretty good raise next year. Um, they're, they're guesstimating that the cost of living increases could be as high as 6%. And something that I learned, and maybe you, either one of you can help me out with this, is that, uh, Social Security has a, has a, co- a cost of living built into it. In other words, if there's a, you know, if there's an increase in inflation, Social Security automatically passes that along to you every year. Well, the VA benefits has to be voted on every con- by Congress each and every year if they're going to get an increase. Is that is my understanding correct on that? We're not on TV, you guys. Yes, <laughs> that, 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 that's yes. very true. As you well know, the budget goes forward, and Congress does have to approve that. And then they take into consideration, you know, across the board, what Social Security, but everything isn't automatic. And, uh, you know, Dale, you threw out 6%, and sometimes it's 2% or 3%, um, the cost of living of COLA. Um, but, you know, I, I think until it happens and it's it's approved, um, we shouldn't count on anything. But, you know, just wait and see what happens. That's that's true. But I think uh, the average over the last couple of years has been about 1%. And, um, you know, cost of living keeps going up. And there are many... You know, there are many veterans out there that are on 100% disability, and this is one of their main sources of income. And uh, I think you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that this is is a possibility at least. And because I know um, I got some, I didn't get it yet, but the, you know, Social Security is supposed to go up in December or January as well. 
And, uh, um, Dale, you yeah. know, you, you just brought up something and I don't know, you know, Michael addressed it just a few seconds ago. When we talk about male irregularities, we, you know, we're out there both serving, but, you know, coming at it from different factions. Um, something else that's going on, and I don't know if, if Michael's seeing this, but we're seeing, um, multiple requests or our veterans that are a hundred percent and that are being called back in for exams and there are proposed reductions um in their in their ratings and so they're going back for exams and we just had one um very fortunate that um that we got the letter as the veteran got the letter um it was pretty timely because um there was going to be a proposed reduced reduction by 1 October um we got this at the beginning of September and um when we looked at it, they had scheduled this veteran, our veteran, for exams. And he said, why am I going in for exams? What am, what are they examining? And what is the proposed reduction? And then when we looked at it, he was 100% total and permanent. And that's a good place to be because, as we well know, they shouldn't be and depending on the years, there's always those opportunities to be reduced. But um, we got that totally reversed by calling in, addressing the issues with the VA, the regional office that um, the veteran is from, or who made the decision to reduce. And uh, But we're seeing the proposed reductions coming across with multiple clients right now. Uh, the, uh, the, the, well, my understanding is, and, and I'm playing the, the you know the naive uh, recipient of disability benefits. You know, since I'm, I'm not 100 percent, obviously, I can't say obviously, but um, theoretically, they could call me in for for a reevaluation. Correct. No. No. Oh, they couldn't, Michael. No. Okay. They can't call Dale in. No. <laughs> okay. That's good. No. Why is that? Because you don't have any future exams attached to your ratings. The only people that have to go in for exams after they get their ratings are any ones that have future exams. And there are certain disability ratings that require a future exam, such as PTSD. The regulation requires that within three to five years of the initial rating, the veteran be re-examined to determine the severity of the condition, to determine whether the evaluation should be decreased or increased based on symptomatology after three to five years. Similarly, traumatic brain injuries are required as well as to have a future examination. There are some disabilities in, on their initial ratings that the VA, if they determine there is a likelihood that the disability could uh, uh, get better through treatment. They will place a future exam on that particular disability. And yes, they can call you back in and examine you. And, and it's, it shouldn't be a surprise to veterans and, and, and it shouldn't be a surprise to advocates. As a matter of fact, the software that we use, we can input when a veteran has a future exam and it gives us a diary date and it prompts us to go into veterans benefits management system to see if the VA has actually sent out the end product 310 routine future exam um, because we know it's coming. Now, if we get medical evidence before that future exam that suggests that the examination is not necessary, then we'll do our advocacy work and, and, and submit that evidence and request that the future exam be removed because we get medical evidence that says the condition will never get better from any kind of treatment. Okay, but now, if and when the VA does schedule these future exams, in most cases, they will then not schedule any further futures unless, again, they feel like the condition's gotten better and there's a likelihood that it could get even better. But most times, veterans only go in for one future exam. Now, why a person that has a permanent and total rating? Now, that's now here's the reason why I'm going to say this. A person with a permanent and total rating at 100% or any rate should never have a should never get called in for an examination or have a proposal to reduce because they're permanent and total which means that there's nothing that should prompt anyone 
to propose to reduce them because there's not, they're, they're not scheduled for future exams. No one's going to pull their record and schedule them for an exam. So I, I that, that was a mistake. That, that, that is not the standard. That mm-hmm. had to be a mistake um, for that veteran that you were working with that was permanent in total. I have talked to a, a, you know, a number of, of friends of mine in the local area who have had cancer and, you know, got a certain disability for that cancer. But once they were cured of that cancer, then their disability was cut. It's not, it's not cut. It's reduced. And, and that's another thing that advocates need to. I have to, to watch my language here. Well, yeah. Well, that's something that advocates really need to do is that they have to explain to their veterans that there's, there's two ratings for cancer. 0% and 100%. That's it. The 100% rating is always assigned if the condition is active or actively being treated. And then, yes, the VA puts future exams on that veteran's um, disability to determine if the cancer has been resolved or if it's still actively being treated. If it's still actively being treated, they will continue the 100% evaluation. Once it's, eva- it's, it's gone, then there's no disability. And I I know that's a weird uh, rationale, but the VA's rating schedule says, well, there's no disability causing 100% disability. So they reduce it to their other scheduler rating, which is zero. So now what they then have to do and are required to do with all cancer ratings is they have to, they have to um, rate the veteran on any residual conditions that was related to the treatment of the cancer. I'll give you an example. Prostate cancer, um, if they do a radical prospectectomy, that's going to lead to erectile dysfunction. So the veteran will be service-connected secondary to the prostate cancer based on the, uh, or excuse me, secondary service-connected for the erectile dysfunction based on the removal of the prostate. Now, when you remove the prostate, it causes urinary dysfunction or uh, and um a urinary uh, in, uh, frequency, as well as um, some other voiding dysfunctions. So then the, the VA is obligated to rate that veteran on either urinary uh, frequency or voiding dysfunction. And those ratings go, what, 10, 30, 60. So, you know, depending on how often the veteran's using the bathroom or how often a veteran is uh, changing absorbent materials, Based on the removal of the prostate, the VA will service connect that secondary condition and then um, have a residual rating for the cancer. Same with, um, I I had this happen with a person that was treated with lung cancer. Now, his lung cancer was permanent in total because it would never, no treatment would cause it to go away. But he was treated with chemotherapy and it led to hearing loss and dementia. And both hearing loss, yes, hearing loss and dementia are secondary medical conditions to chemotherapy treatment. So this veteran was service connected for or his lung cancer, but then at the same time, I got him secondary service connected for his dementia and his hearing loss. So yes, the VA's ratings for cancer are zero and 100. Same, I'll give you another example about when a disability doesn't exist anymore. Say, for instance, a veteran's got a 40% rating on a knee but then has a knee replacement, the VA will take away that 40% rating <laughs> because that knee that had the 40% rating isn't there anymore. Okay. And the residual for knee replacement is 30% automatic. There's two ratings, 30 and 60. So yeah, so that veteran's 40% goes away and possibly goes down to 30 Um, But yeah, unfortunately, yes. When the, when the condition goes away, the rating that evaluated it goes away with it. No, I, I, I understand that. And that, and that, I mean, that makes sense. Although I was a little, you know, we did, um, we did a program a couple of weeks ago on, on alternative post-traumatic stress treatments. And, you know, they're, they're saying, well, I, you know, in, in five days or something like that, uh, after, after our treatment, you would be healed. You know, you wouldn't have it anymore. And I'm just going, well, I mean, that'd be great. I mean, from a, from a, from an emotional standpoint, that would be great. But then from a financial standpoint, you're going, but if I get cured, then, you know, off goes the, you know, the disability payment. Is that, is that, 
you mentioned, you know, that post-traumatic stress had that three to four window, three to four year window, and then you don't get reevaluated, right? Your mic, your mic's off, Mike. Um. So, for those who are uh, recently separated from the military and they get an evaluation of PTSD, the regulation requires that within three to five years, they have a future exam. Then there are other veterans who are actively engaged in treatment at the time that they are um, evaluated for PTSD. So the VA may put a future exam on them under the likelihood that they're, that the treatment that they're engaged could cause the, the condition to get better. Now, in a greater majority of my cases, and it's just, It's just because of the evidence that we present. My veterans come away with their 50 or 70 percent PTSD evaluations with no future exams because the medical and the rater can make that decision. If the evidence in the record suggests that the the veteran's condition is static and that treatment is not going to help or the veteran is not engaged in treatment. So whatever the symptoms are at the time means that they're not going to get any better at, 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 at best, they're going to get worse. Mm-hmm. So I have seen the VA assign those evaluations and not give a future exam. And okay. that's up to the rater. Right. All right. We need to take a quick break. I want to remind everybody we're talking benefits today. I see we have a question on our chat board um, from someone in, in Detroit. And uh, we're going to address that when we come back. You're listening to Veterans Radio. The number is 734-822-1600. We'll be right back after this. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Sergeant First Class Stanley Adams led a 13-man charge against a North Korean force of 150. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. Adams' platoon, holding an outpost some 200 yards ahead of his company, came under a determined attack by an estimated 250 enemy troops. Intense small arms, machine gun, and mortar fire from three sides pressed the platoon back against the main line of resistance. Observing approximately 150 hostile troops silhouetted against the skyline advancing against his platoon, Adams leaped to his feet, urged his men to fix bayonets, and with 13 members of his platoon charged the hostile force. Within 50 yards of the enemy, Adams was knocked to the ground when pierced in the leg by an enemy bullet. He jumped to his feet and, ignoring his wound, continued on to close with the enemy when he was knocked down four times from the concussion of grenades which had bounced off his body. Shouting orders, he charged the enemy positions and engaged them in hand-to-hand combat where man after man fell before his terrific onslaught with bayonet and rifle butt. After nearly an hour of vicious action, Adams and his comrades routed the fanatical foe, killing over 50 and forcing the remainder to withdraw. Upon receiving orders that his battalion was moving back, he provided cover fire while his men withdrew. Adams so inspired his comrades that the enemy attack was completely thwarted, saving his battalion from possible disaster. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative, maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. Even small actions can make a world of difference. If you know a veteran in crisis, please call the Veterans Crisis Line, 800-273-8255, 800-273-8255. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And we're back here on Veterans Radio, and we are talking with our disability experts uh, this week. They are uh, retired Air Force General Carol Ann Falson from Legal Help for Veterans and our VA benefits guru locally, Michael Smith, Executive Director of the Washtenaw County Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, we had a question while we were on a break from uh, someone in Detroit uh, asking about back injury. And, Michael, you wrote a, a, a response to that. Could you do that verbally? 
So a, a lot of veterans injure their backs or have um, requirements in the military where they receive small, like, traumas to the back. There's nothing that they can point to, like, I, I jumped off a truck and fell down and hit my back. It could be impact injuries from running. It could be carrying 35 to 100 pounds on your back with all your full gear as you're navigating over rough terrain. It could be a lot of different things that can literally hurt your back, and you never go in and complain about it. And then years later, you have problems in your your lumbar region or your thoracic regions of your back, typically going to be lumbar. And most doctors can look at the loss of the disc space and the disc degeneration in the uh, vertebral spine, and they can determine from there when that degeneration began. They can look at you and say, you know, we typically see this kind of loss of disc space over a period of 10 to 15 years. So if that 10 to 15 years puts you back into military service, that doctor's opinion about when that degeneration began in your back could be the very medical evidence that can tie it back to military service. And yes, you can establish service connection and receive disability compensation for any back injury. All right. Well, uh, WTTK, I, I suggest that you contact uh, some veteran service officer, uh, either uh, Carol Ann or Michael, and um, maybe they can help you out on that. Um, Carol Ann, I wanted to, to uh, ask you about uh, if you've heard or received any information on the uh, uh, notice I got about uh, discharged LB, LGBTQ veterans are now eligible for benefits under new guidance issued by the VA. I don't know if you were familiar with that. It says, uh, where did it go? It goes back to the, hold on. There we go. It says, uh, given a large number of LGBTQ plus veterans who were affected by previous homophobic and transphobic policies have not applied for any discharge upgrade. Many people were discharged, um, uh, as, you know, less than honorable discharges uh, as a result of that back in the nineties and prior to that, and evidently it is something that is being addressed by the uh, VA head administrator, McDonnell. Now, the VA would offer um, help for these men and women that are um, that were discharged early. Are you familiar with that? Well, the only thing I could say is um, I would encourage these individuals to talk to somebody because every case is different. And um, just a blanket statement, I would ask them to come in, see a um, VSO, county counselor, um, give us a call. Uh, we really need to know your story. Um, but, yes, uh, there are multiple cases that come in front of us that we can look at your story and um, advise what you should do, um, apply, um, and um, take it from there. I don't know, Michael, if you've had any experience with that so far. Uh, no, it's, it's actually relatively new, like within the last two weeks, I believe. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not real certain about what the what the secretary is going to do about the other than honorable discharges, because that has to be addressed by the individual's branches of service. So hopefully that guidance uh, gets to the branches of service. But if the secretary intends to extend benefits to those veterans who have other than honorable discharges, um, then they certainly can do that both on the benefit side and on the health care side. Healthcare side, right. Because the VA's definition of a veteran is a person who served in, on active duty in the armed forces of the United States and received a discharge other than dishonorable. So believe it or not, an other than honorable discharge and a bad conduct ch- discharge are other than dishonorable. So it, it, it could still position people to uh, receive benefits, but under VA regulations on the Veterans Benefits Administration side, they go through a process of what's called an administrative decision to determine if that person's other than honorable discharge or bad conduct discharge should be considered honorable for VA benefits side. Well, unfortunately, the hospital side doesn't have that same administrative uh, review process. So they typically will not extend health care benefits to a person with an other than honorable discharge. I believe what the secretary is instructing his people to do now is if those veterans 
appear or present for benefits and they have an other than honorable discharge, they can extend benefits to them with, without having to instruct them to have a discharge upgrade first. Okay. Well, I, I, I thought this was a really valuable uh, piece of news or important piece of news. Um, I got this from Kayla Williams, who happens to be an author. She was, I uh, love my rifle more than, I can't remember the name of the book exactly, but she's now an undersecretary, assistant secretary in the Office of Public and Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Affairs at the, at the VA. Uh, she announced this on, uh, last Monday, the 20th, help grant benefits to veterans who were, who were forced out of, of the military because of their uh, sexual orientation. Um, Monday, the, back on the 20th, marked the 10th anniversary of the repeal of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which barred uh, L- LGBT troops from serving openly. And so it's, uh, you know, th- things change over time. And things that were acceptable 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago are no longer acceptable. And uh, it's something that we have to get used to. And I think that that's really important. Uh, we're talking here on Veterans Radio with uh, retired Air Force General Carol Ann Falson from Legal Help for Veterans and Michael Smith from Washtenaw County uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. And I had a request that just came in. Could could I, I ask you folks to uh, give out your phone numbers? Because we've got uh, a request. Sure. Um, at Legal Help for Veterans, our number to call is one 800 Six nine three four eight zero zero um with questions um anything we could help you with related to our disability um opportunities for you michael and you can um reach me at the washington county department of veterans affairs again i'm the the director of the county department of veterans affairs and our main number is seven three four nine seven three Four five four zero, again seven three four, nine seven three four five four zero. Okay, thank you. Um, hey Dale, hey Dale. Go ahead. One thing, I'm sorry. You started off with talking about that the VA um, health system is now offering um, the COVID shots. When um, people are calling and talking to their primary care, will you? Um, remind our listening audience to also ask their providers about the flu shots, because I think that's going to be very critical also. And um, the way the VA, I mean, we're hearing all this stuff, you know, you could get them the same day, opposite arms, you have to wait a period of time. But I really believe the important thing is to ask your physician what he or she is recommending Um maybe even which order and the period of time, um, the lag time between COVID and flu. But please ask them if you should get the shot, the period of time, um, and then also could, should I get the flu shot? So I'm sorry, I that's been in my mind from the beginning, so I just wanted to shout that out. That's okay. That's that, That's just the nurse coming out of you. I have to remind people that, that General Fasson is, is a nurse and was a nurse and probably always will be a nurse. So I think that's very beneficial to find out about that. I just had my flu shot the other day. Um, and I neglected to ask about order or anything along those lines. I guess I'll find that out. I have a VA appointment this week, as usual, another appointment. Um, so what we've got about 50, wow, we've only got about 15 minutes maybe uh, left to go. I was wondering if there was any issues that, that you have had um, come up in the last month since we talked with you last. Michael, I'll go with you first. Anything else happening? Well, you know, we are all trying to get together a list of issues that we want to address to uh, an official that we have access to. He was a former County Veteran Service Officer for Redwood County, Minnesota, and he served in our leadership in our National Association of County Veteran Service Officers. And um, Cheryl Mason, who is the um, the uh, chief judge or the director of the Board of Veterans Appeals, she 
essentially created a position for him to be a liaison between county veteran service officers and the Board of Veterans Appeals. So she created a position for him, and Marty's been in that position for about a year now, maybe less than a year. And I, we have all been having problems with access to information for any of our appeals that we send to the Board of Veterans Appeals under the new AMA, or Appeals Modernization Act. The VA used to process and track those claims in a software called Vacles, where they're moving away from Vacles into a new system called Caseflow, and they're also trying to process and store some of their documents in the Veterans Benefits Management System. And so it's hard for us to get access to information because they're not in any of those systems. <laughs> so we have to call the, the Board of Veterans Appeals hotline, and those are people just looking at a computer screen and all they do is so, yeah, uh, it went to a BVA law judge on the 8th of December, 2020. Do you know when maybe that BVA law judge will get to a decision? No, no idea. So um, that's, that's an issue is just access to information from the Board of Veterans Appeals. And it's not just something that cropped up over the last month. It's been an issue for a while. Um, but I think it's more important for me because over the last month, my staff and I have all been trying to get information on our, on our BVA cases and we're relegated to the BVA hotline. So I'm going to email Marty and see if I can't reach out to him and ask him about that, about, um, access issues because we all, we have vehicles and we have case flow. We have remote access to those VA computing systems. But when I enter my veterans' social security numbers or their, their claims numbers in there, they're not in that system. So that's the reason why I have to call the hotline. So that's another issue. And then one of the other ones, General Faso, and I don't know if you've been dealing with this, but there's only two VROCs, and those are called Decision Review Operation Centers, or there's three of them in the United there's States. Three. And those, those are for people who elect a different appellate route, which is called a higher level review. And then with that higher level review, you can request an informal conference with a decision review um, officer. Well, when we submit these, we're not getting called by the decision review officers to schedule our hearings. And in some instances, they're saying that they called us the two times that they're required to, but we never get any messages. And because they claim that they reached out to us on the required two occasions and we weren't available, they close out our our, conf- our our request for informal conference. So that's another issue that we're I'm going to try to address with Marty when I email him, because a lot of us out here are working remotely, and this opportunity to advocate for our clients uh, over a telephone conversation with a VA employee is not happening the way we need it to be. And it's not because we're not available. It's because the VA is not accessible, and they're not contacting us the way they should. And, and Michael, yes, um, we're experiencing that, but on a different level, obviously. Oh, she froze up there. Um, for the country. And what we've been facing with, with the three D rocks is Seattle. Um, there's Seattle, St. Pete and DC. And we. Okay. Um, Carol Ann, you may need to. Log off and log in again. We've, we've lost your audio, unfortunately. Um, uh, I'm interested in these conversations only make, to make sure that our, that your clients and all veterans out there that are, are, are working with, you know, attempting to work with the VA to, you know, submit a claim, you know, see what happens to the claim petition, you know, for a review and so on and so forth is that it can be just as frustrating for you to work with it as it does for anybody else. And that they can only, I can only imagine if, if I had done it or many of my other friends had done this on our own. So I'm encouraging our veteran listening audience to don't even try it on your own. Contact somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Uh, ask a friend who's already done it, uh, with, you know, with someone and, and, and go that way because we've been trying to figure out how we could get a list of all of the, most efficient uh, veteran service officers out there across the country so we could refer people to particular officers. And uh, yeah, I, I think that the streamlining, uh, as we have talked about in the past, has you know, ended up being more confusing 
than anything else. Um, my, my other question, what's going to be, have you seen any changes since the new administration has come in or is it the same or is it getting better? Or is it getting worse? Do you see any, any, any changes at all? Keeping it, it, it they're smiling. This is radio folks and they're smiling at me. <laughs> so I'm not sure what, what this means. So, so Dale, with, 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 with the transition of any administration, it, it takes time for key leadership to get put in place. Secretary McCon- McDonough is certainly a good pick. He, um, I don't know how many weeks that he's been on board. It's certainly not long, but he addressed our National Association of County Veteran Service Officers um, at our conference. There was a hundred of them in D.C., so they were able to see him um, personally. <clears throat> the rest of us joined them <clears throat> virtually. <clears throat> but he has different priorities. <clears throat> than the former secretary. So he's got to come in and outline his priorities. He's got to get his deputy undersecretaries in place. And, um, but now the infrastructure, we always like to call the, the bureaucracy, the fourth branch of government. The bureaucracy is still grinding it out based on the laws and the regulations that govern what they should be doing in their work. And, and we haven't seen any shifts in policy yet. That will probably come once the new secretary gets on board fully. But right now, in terms of the work, nothing has changed in the work. Okay. General Falzon, anything you've, you've observed? No, I, you know, I think they're trying to address issues and, um, and Michael's correct. You know, when the, when there is a change in power, it's looking at and evaluating what's present what they're going to change, you know, um, hopefully, you know, you mentioned um, he will get the credit if there's a nice increase in the disability rating, um, a COLA increase, you know, um, I think we just have to wait and see what happens. There's, you know, there's been just too much that's occurred um, across the world uh, regarding our military And so um, I would say, let's just stay tuned. And we have to keep taking care of our veterans and keep doing veterans benefits weekends. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We're we're here every month, folks, out there to uh, make sure that we uh, that we talk about uh, veterans benefits and what your what your options are. You know, if you think you've been injured uh, while you were in the service or you, you know, were exposed to, you know, and any sort of toxins out there that have affected your life, um, you know, this is the opportunity for you to ask your questions. You can go, you know, also you can go to uh, some of their websites. I know Legal Health for Veterans has a whole bunch of uh, little short articles about various conditions that you can go to. You can contact Michael. Um, But don't don't ignore them. Don't think um, the, the question that comes out always, you know, well, I don't deserve it. Well, you put your life on the line. And whatever happened is causing you problems and, and, and expense somewhere down the road. And if this was caused by your uh, military service, then you are certainly entitled to them. You earned them. And uh, I, I would uh, strongly suggest that you uh, attempt to utilize them as well. Uh, Michael, you had something? We've got about three minutes to go. Okay, I'm just going to real quickly say this. I know we had uh, someone that emailed us, and reading that, being a survivor of military sexual trauma, uh, the person said that the Army removed, uh, uh, she had to have a hysterectomy, suffers from PTSD, severe depression, hypertension, and COPD, then claims that the VA has denied her. Now, there's so many things that popped out at me during reading that Service connection for the removal of her uterus should come with a special monthly compensation for the loss of use of a creative organ. So I don't understand why the VA would deny that, especially if it happened while she was in the military. Yes, the MST can lead to the PTSD and the removal of the uterus can lead to depression. So there's so many things there that, a, you know, a trained service officer can read that kind of stuff. And the things I'm thinking are either there weren't no medical diagnoses. Um, There was a negative opinion against her. Um, Someone didn't link the depression to the um, uh, hysterectomy. 
Um, so sometimes when we as service officers read things like that, we immediately begin to triage what may be missing. So I would encourage that person who wrote in and, and any of the other listeners, please work with a county veteran service officer, a state veteran service officer, or a veteran service officer, or a department service officer with any of the veteran service organizations. We are all trained and accredited by the VA to know their laws and their rules and their forms and their processes and procedures so that we can be your best advocates and make sure that your claims are successful. Thank you. Uh, so you, we obviously, oh, we only have a minute to go. Wow. All right. Well, this went <laughs> rather quickly. So uh, last words, General Fasone, go. Just thank you, everybody. And I thank our veterans again over and over. Please um, write us. Um, if you're out there, you shouldn't do it alone. We want to thank you for your service. We're there to help you. Okay. Thank you. Michael, last words. Um, just one of the things that I want to uh, remind folks is that the Washington County Department of Veterans Affairs has their Veterans Relief Fund. We help people with all kinds of financial relief. The Michigan Veterans Affairs Agency has the newly created County Veterans County Veterans Service Fund grant that has we're in the third fiscal year of that. Uh, oh, Senator Adams, we're the we're director, was there I gotta, at our I conference, and they have I money for counties. I have to cut you off. <laughs> Thank you for listening. You are dismissed. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver? I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.